Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer. I'm Mirna Kvayo, an editor at Cell, and I'm sitting here to, today with Susan Clark from the Garvan Institute of Medical Research in Sydney. Hi, Susan. Hello. So, um, you are studying the role of epigenetics in normal cells behavior and function and also in disease. And I guess it's also fair to say that you are perhaps one of the pioneers in epigenetics. You've been one of the first people who studied, for instance, the changes such as methylation in DNA. And um, from what I understand, you also were, were the first to develop a sequencing method that allows us to look at methylation patterns. Um, and so um, this all happened in the 90s, right? So can you tell me a little bit about um, about how you came into this field and, and you know, uh, what, what, what really drove you to this field and, and, and to ask these problems of epigenetics, yeah. which were, that was a very early time, I guess. Yeah. I suppose my journey started in the mid-1970s um, mm -hmm. when I started my degree um, in molecular biology to understand how genes were regulated. And that was the time um, of when they first introduced and discovered restriction enzymes and ligation and cloning and my PhD in the late 70s was actually to clone histone genes, human histone mm -hmm. genes for the first time and sequence them and in those days we were using maximum Gilbert sequencing and I don't know if you remember that but you could read the bases on the mm -hmm. um, acrylamide gel yeah. and what we noticed then was that at CCG sites um, the migration of the bands were different mm -hmm. and we wondered whether that migration meant that that cytosine was methylated. So from that time, which was 1978, I started to look at ways of being able to detect methylation and restriction enzymes was one way of looking at methylation but we were wanting to go beyond that and it took till the early 90s to actually um, put together different pieces of the literature and I had been working in a biotechnology industry up until that time and then I went on and had children and when I came back after having children the field had developed enough and um, there was now this chemistry out there which was called bisulfite chemistry uh -huh. and I joined the lab of Marianne Frommer who was also interested in methylation and so together with her, we developed this uh, combination of using bisulfide and PCR mm -hmm. to uh, see if that would be a way of being able to detect methylation. Mm -hmm. And after lots of trials and tribulation, we were able to get the methodology to work, such that the bisulfide treatment, it's really quite magical, it converts an unmethylated cytosine to a uracil, and after PCR amplification, that gets converted to a thymine. So by simply sequencing um, DNA after bisulfite conversion, then you could read whether it was methylated or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this was something that, that I guess really gave you the entryway to start looking at met methylation patterns, really, methylation right. in a more global way. Well, it totally changed post, right? what we thought about methylation. Yeah. So in 1975, um, Art Riggs and Robin Holiday proposed methylation may have a role in gene regulation mm -hmm. and so that really got me into the mm -hmm. field. But because the technology um, was such you could only use restriction enzymes, it was very difficult to show a cause or consequence. And the field really um, didn't get much traction because uh, in the 80s uh, it was shown that Drosophila and worms don't have methylation mm -hmm. and so suddenly then its role in gene regulation became not something that people thought was possible. Because people were looking also at model, model organisms That's and they right. really wanted to and focus on So it killed the field. Oh. Uh, so it was really <laughs> fantastic to then get a new method that you could actually go beyond restriction enzymes and look at any sequence and look at, um, at a molecular level every cytosine and look at the methylation pattern. And so that was uh, the first time that we could then show that methylation truly did um, a, it was important mm -hmm. in mammalian cells and it was uh, different in different cell types. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think at the same time, um, the methyltransferase enzymes mm -hmm. were knocked out and they were lethal knockouts in mouse. And so in combination with that, showing it must be important, and 
then having a method to be able to detect methylation, I think really did impact on opening up yeah. the field again for yeah. people yeah. to be interested in. Yeah. And so I guess you started off by looking at this in a really very fundamental way, right? Oh, Trying to understand yes. this this fundamental process of, of, of modifications to the DNA. But uh, at the same time, um, I guess uh, there was the awareness that this could be important for you know pathological states. So you, you moved on. I mean, you're now working on cancer, right? I am now, but that took a long time. So initially, we started uh, looking at methylation profiles of different cell types. CPG islands, showing that they're unmethylated, and then we went on to tissue-specific promoters to show that they were differentially methylated, and then we went on to look during embryo development uh, to see how, at least at, at candidate genes, how their methylation uh, change from fertilization through to implantation. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was basically the work that we did in the late 1900s. 1900s. <laughs> in two, well, it doesn't feel like right. that. <laughs> in the late 1990s. Um, and it was then very difficult to get funding to do yeah. basic research. Yeah, right. And so that's when we thought, well, if we re look at our question mm -hmm. in uh, relation to disease, mm -hmm. how does methylation change in disease? Mm -hmm. And so that really was a very good uh, move to make. Yeah. Um, and I was very inspired. I think with the first report that uh, retinoblastoma is mutated mm -hmm. in retinoblastoma tumours. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, let's ask the question, could it be that it is also methylated? So uh, we collaborated with one of the key um, drivers in the retinoblastoma mm -hmm. field, and he sent us DNA from retinoblastoma tumours. And we did bisulfite sequencing on the retinoblastoma promoter CPG Island and showed for the first time using bisulfite sequencing that it, indeed many of the retinoblastoma tumours were one allele was methylated and one was mutated. Mm -hmm. And so it really showed for the first time that it wasn't just genetic mistakes yeah. in these uh, key driver tumour suppressor genes, also methylation was a uh, bona fide way of switching mm -hmm. off the tumour suppressor gene. I guess that complicated a little bit things for people who are really hoping that actually looking at you can look at cancer as a really purely like genetic disease, right? Well, I think it's it still is a debate in right? the field. Okay. Um, there's mm -hmm. still a debate on, uh -huh. on which comes first. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's quite clear going from that very first example that we could then show, as did many people in the field, that it's not just single genes mm -hmm. that become methylated. Mm -hmm. Many hundreds, thousands of genes mm -hmm. get differentially methylated. Um, there is a whole program of dysregulation, essentially, there is, in the system. I suppose the other major finding um, that we made, this was in 2006, was people were looking primarily at single genes, and mm -hmm. then we asked, could there be regions um, of contiguous mm -hmm. gene um, repression due mm -hmm. to methylation? Um, and so that was very surprising at the time, to mm -hmm. show that it wasn't just single CPG, islands, but you could have megabases of CPG islands mm -hmm. that were commonly methylated, mm -hmm. showing that there must be a program uh, that is eliciting this mm -hmm. uh, regional change mm -hmm. in epigenetic reprogramming in cancer. Did you, did you go on um, to look at other cancer types? I mean, is there, is there like a kind of general, general idea about how much uh, how much is methylation changed in, in cancer and uh, whether this really changes with different cancer types? And, uh yes, so at the time it really wasn't known. Um, we were fairly opportunistic in picking cancer types where mm -hmm. we could have a collaboration with the clinician oh. so we could get mm -hmm. um, clinical material. Uh, so we moved from retinoblastoma tumors to leukemia mm -hmm. and then we moved from leukemia to prostate and breast cancer. But I think over time, um, now uh, with the ICGC and TCGA um, uh, programs, it's very clear that mm -hmm. um, methylation changes are very common in cancer, but each um, clinical sample might have a different level of methylation. Okay. Do you think that picking retinoblastoma was, uh, was a very lucky well, pick in the way? No, I think no? picking retinoblastoma no? was, was very insightful to okay. actually show that it was a key tumor mm -hmm. suppressor gene could mm -hmm. be methylated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, by now we know that there are many, many different, many different modifications of this mm. DNA and they all 
kind of thought a lot in the context of cancer and other things. Yes. And I think, um, uh, do you do you work on other modifications? <clears throat> yeah. So it, I suppose we've moved from just looking at methylation because one um, one of the key questions that is still not solved in the field is what elicits the change in methylation. Mm -hmm. So in cancer you have global hypomethylation, so loss of methylation, in addition to the gain of hypermethylation mm -hmm. at CPG islands. Mm -hmm. So we're very interested to understand what the cause of that is. And so to understand the cause, we thought, well, maybe it's associated with histone modifications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, with the development of ChIP-seq, it's, it's obviously now possible mm -hmm. to be able to overlay both the methylation marks mm -hmm. with the histone modification marks yeah. to yeah. see what the correlation is between yeah. methylation and histone, both in normal cells and in the cancer state. Yeah, mm. I mean, it, it seems like this field really, I, I mean, I think the field of, of epigenetics and, you know, in general, kind of just uh, exploring the genome really um, has uh, had, had a big influx of new techniques, right, yes. which really allow this very That's global right. uh, analysis of what's going on. Um, and you know, we can see, I mean, we, we see new techniques and new kind of um, adjustments of techniques and, and uh, improvements coming on all the all time. The time. I mean, it must be almost confusing. Well, <laughs> you probably start off a project at one point yes. and then in the meantime there are several iterations of, of how know. you could do it differently, right? I, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think with all fields, and this one in particular, it's driven by technology. Right? Just yeah. like recombinant yeah. DNA technology yeah. 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 was yeah. driven by yeah. uh, restriction enzymes mm -hmm. and cloning. And so I think that's true all the time. But in particular, this field is really at such yeah. a fast pace. It is fast pace. And none yeah. of these techniques are simple yeah. to yeah. develop. Yes, yes. Um, and so, yes, you're right. You just think you've got a great result with the technique <laughs> and suddenly it can be surpassed yeah. And, yeah. and clearly the reviewers or your um, referees will say, why don't you try but this as well? <laughs> and I think um, this is where CRISPR is really mm -hmm. another technique yeah. that allows you to now yeah. manipulate mm -hmm. um, these epigenetic marks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a game changer awesome. rather than just now profiling mm -hmm. and looking at patterns, um, we now have the opportunity in the field to be able to manipulate to see okay. what hopefully elicits these patterns in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. So that's actually what I wanted to ask you. So indeed you would think game-changing technique would be something like CRISPR for you. That's how you feel. And I think is so. There a I think a game-changer is really something that allows you to manipulate or perturb. Yeah. So the problem with looking at cancer is that by the time we can identify the cancer, by the time it's mm -hmm. large enough for the surgeon to be able to mm -hmm. take it out, oh, yeah. all of these epigenetic changes have already happened. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. You're going from a static state of the match normal mm -hmm. cell to the cancer mm -hmm. cell. And so we really need a way of being able to either follow it from the pre-malignant cell mm -hmm. or a way of manipulating what we think might be drivers mm -hmm. and then to go back and test whether mm -hmm. they are or not. Mm -hmm. So that would be on your wish list, a way of, of having a kind of a dynamic picture of what's going on. I think right? for me the, the wish list is to start from a, not in a mass model, because mm -hmm. I, from my point of view I think um, human cancers are really quite unique because it takes a long time mm -hmm. for a cancer to grow, especially mm -hmm. prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think ideally we need model systems in a human that we can follow. And so that's where single cell technology mm -hmm. I think is another mm -hmm. game changer mm -hmm. to be able to not just look at a mass. Because yeah. as we know, um, methylation is a very heterogeneous disease. Yeah. And so to be able to do single cell technology mm -hmm. and then follow those mm -hmm. cells as they migrate yeah. um, is really fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think in fact, in, I mean, you, you gave a very interesting talk today, and in your talk, you, you again, you used a, a yet another technique which allows you to move kind of a step beyond looking at DNA and really looking at the whole genome. And you were talking about um, the way um, changes in the chromatin conformation also mm. in cancer you know, confer some properties to the cell which are different from um, from the normal properties of the cell. And so, um, so I was wondering, um, can you can you tell me why? I mean, what, why should we care how how is the genome folded? I mean, how is the chromatin folded? And why, I mean, why are cancer cells different in that matter? Mm. Well, I think it's, it's a really interesting question because we commonly just think of the genome as linear yeah. um, because yeah. that's how the sequence is when we put it on a page, it's how we visualize it. But we have to remember that DNA 
work isn't linear, mm -hmm. it's folded in this mm -hmm. incredibly um, compact and exquisite way inside the nucleus. And one of the challenges has been how do we determine what that structure is mm -hmm. inside the nucleus? Mm -hmm. And so with the development of high C uh, chromatin confirmation, sequencing technology has allowed us for the first time to be able to get a picture, a snapshot of how the chromatin interacts, or if you like, kisses each other yeah. inside the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And so we were quite interested to see whether this confirmation changes in cancer. So we were able to use high C technology and compare between normal prostate cells and prostate cancer cells to look at the topological domains um, mm -hmm. and where the changes might be. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. cancer cells are in essence really when it comes to their genome change on so many levels, right? And uh, the way some transcriptional programs are going to happen or not really seems to depend on, on, on all of this, all of these factors, right? Um, well, I think it's all... Um, interdependent on mm -hmm. each other. Okay. So certainly mm -hmm. the genome is um, quite <coughs> deranged in cancer, mm -hmm. and so it's not surprising that, that it actually re that, that, that would have an impact yeah, on the confirmation. Yeah, yeah. I think to us one of the biggest surprises was that the topological domains, the basic structure, is intact. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the the core domains are so intact. It's so really the subdomains. Them. You're expecting them to be very much disrupted because yes, cells, I did, actually. cancer cells are actually are so we, we think of that yeah of their you know, so many translocations and yeah. copy number yeah. changes. I would have predicted that we would have seen a lot more disruption. Mm -hmm. But I think what's essential for cell viability is to maintain this core structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think even though the cancer has got gone a awry in many, many ways, I don't think it can afford to totally disrupt um, its fundamental, if you like, origami shape that makes it mm -hmm. a cell. Mm -hmm. um, but yet you, I mean, so cancer cells are disrupted in certain ways, but even these ways make a certain sense. I mean, yes. they, they kind of, they have their own way of, of dealing with, with I think genetic problems. Um, the other part of our finding, which I think is really quite insightful, is that where we do have structural changes, it involves promoters and enhancers mm -hmm. um, forming um, contacts that are normal contacts mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. the cell. Mm -hmm. And so these new contacts that we showed in cancer are allowing ectopic gene expression. Mm -hmm. So expression of genes that are mm -hmm. normally mm -hmm. in the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. And to be able to show a mechanism that is involved in bringing these uh, enhancers that are not normally used mm -hmm. into contact with the promoters mm -hmm. and then permitting this promiscuous gene expression in cancer, I think is another really wonderful way of being able to visualize what's happening inside the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. So, mm -hmm. so that was great. I very much enjoyed talking okay. to you. And, and, uh, very much enjoyed talking yeah. to you. And this wonderful spot. It is it's a wonderful lovely view. <laughs> <laughs> yes. a beautiful day. Yeah. <laughs> so good. thank right. you so much. Thank and you. Uh, good luck with your research. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.